welcome to the first time Reading have ended a round of matches bottom of the championship in the Medeski Stadium era. Not since the final league game at Elm Park have the Royals found themselves in such a dire scenario. And that is pretty much the subject of episode 167 of the Tyler Stem Podcast with your host Mark Mayer as always. And the person who used to say that opening sentence is joining me back for a very special look at the state of Reading FC and it is... Dan Wimbush, a.k.a. Wim. How is it going, mate? Mark, hello. It is, uh, it is a delight to be back. Um, been listening in for the past season, done a sterling job of holding down the fort. I'm glad to see you've let me back in. I, I thought I'd you know, hop over the fence and sneak back in through the cat flap and uh, do a little cameo. Well, thanks very much for joining us. I know you've been having all sorts of fun with the club recently and enter it, uh, welcoming a new person into your family as well, who's no doubt been a fantastic roller coaster ride but the uh, the roller coaster ride of reading i'm not sure if it really has the highs anymore it just kind of drops you out the the, the trap door of the floor at the moment isn't it yeah i'm not going to suggest that this is your fault but when i did hand over the podcast to you everything was reasonably okay uh, i don't know what's happened since but look there's no disguising it it's been fairly miserable there's been the odd high in there but it's tough it is really tough to be a reading fan at the moment but you know, we'll get into much more of this later on, but sometimes you have to go through these absolutely dire times to enjoy the good ones, and hopefully the good ones will, will be around the corner again soon. Yeah, well, you don't get to pick as a fan exactly when those come up, and, uh, exactly. and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of change around the show's format because we want to get into really the nitty-gritty of, ha- of how Reading FC is looking. Mailbag is going to kind of be interspersed with everything. We'll kick off with a bit of a recap, and then we'll get into the pub chat and really delve into what is going on at Reading FC at this moment in time. So without further ado, let's kick on then and talk about Reading 1, Sheffield Wednesday 2. View from the Tarlhurst End, recapping this week's championship action. So Dan, we came off the back of a 2-0 defeat to Watford in the Carabao Cup. Not really going to have too many complaints about that. It was a you know, pretty by-the-numbers performance for both teams and it came out with the result that you probably would expect against a team near the bottom of the championship compared to near the top of the Premier League. So moving on to Sheffield Wednesday and I always like to start with how the team is uh, how the team is announced and we had sort of John Daddy Bod Varson who ruled out through a sort of sudden injury. Chris Gunter got put, put back into the team right back. Andy Yadom shoved over to left back which he did okay against Watford. Sort of cameo performance there. But it seems to me like there's a number of players in that starting lineup. Even before the game, you can tell. For me, it's Yaku Mate, Sonia Luko, Leandro Bakuna, perhaps Sam Baldock, perhaps David Myler. Feels like every team sheet getting announced at the moment, there's a lot of players being carried in that. A lot of passengers who are just kind of there because perhaps there's no one to replace them. Uh, yeah, and no. I mean, Paul Clement's certainly shown his teeth in the last couple of weeks. It's. You know, I think it's been a long time since we've had both John Swift and Liam Kelly fully fit and both have started on the bench. You know, we've we've chopped and changed. Tyler Blackett can consider himself a bit unlucky, I think, mm. to be dropped out of the squad, um, albeit for a very experienced player in Chris Gunter. So it's one of those scenarios where I don't know if people are being carried. It's just the whole chemistry at the moment. There is something missing. Each of those players that you've mentioned, they've got redeeming features and every single one of them, even... Shawnee Aluko, dare I say, it, has had a good game in a Reading shirt at some point. You know, Aluko, for as much as he's been deservedly criticised, you go back to his very first few games in a Reading shirt, he was doing all right. His set pieces were creating a couple of goals. He was in the mix. Even late last season, we had that absolute thunderbolt against QPR. So it's how you get the best out of this group, because you look at it on paper and every one of these players, again, that we mentioned, is a good championship player is at least an average championship player. And some of them are top of the championship players. So why as a unit, uh, uh, are they playing so poorly together? I think that's the question we've got to try and get to the bottom. Not just us, but Paul Clement and the whole club will get to the bottom of. Certainly that is the case. And for me, it's, it made me think then, as you talked about Aluko's QPR goal, it's the lack of a catalyst. It's the lack of someone to sort of move the ball into dangerous areas with precision. And Swift and Kelly, I think Paul Clement tried as hard as he could to get them both into the team at the start of the season and it's the fact that they're not in the team shows that he's really had to work out a new way of playing and playing David Myler and Leandro Bakuna away at Aston Villa for example 
is you know pretty legitimate because you know that Aston Villa are going to play in a certain way. You're probably going to be on the back foot. But when it comes to a home game, the scenario changes again, and it's very telling that he hasn't got the faith or the confidence to a change this to a put this put them in the team to begin with, and b to change the system around them and say you know what I'm going to hand John Swift the free roll behind the striker or or something just be a bit creative with it. And it, in response, he's going to basic 4-4-2, put it out wide, wingers who sort of know what they're doing with the ball at least, strikers up front, Bulldogs a regular finisher, Mate's got his, his qualities. And that limited approach is actually having a big impact on the pitch in games such as home games against Sheffield Wednesday. Well, I feel quite sorry for him because he gave Kelly and Swift chances. He's given them so many chances to impress, even... Midweek, he changed that team that had done, you know, gotten a couple of points. He changed it against Watford to give people like Swift a game and he lets him down. And you really feel for managers in that scenario because it's clear he does know that he wants that more attacking player, that more creative player in the middle. But if that player is not playing well enough to get in the team, what can you do? We've seen it with past managers, be it Coppel, McDermott, some of the best, when they've overly loyally stuck that same player in even when they're not playing well fans just get on their back and you know even the best of players look at how Mikel Leisurewood's career effectively ended it's at Reading just thinking his name that got, <laughs> um, yeah. and he's clearly desperate to get someone like a Swift or Kelly fight. you look at the summer recruitment and it's clear that the board or Clement or Brian Tavraden and whoever it is made that decision backed Kelly and Swift because they didn't go out and sign another really creative midfielder. Yes, we've got our new signing in whose name I'm not even going to try and pronounce. Um, I'll leave that to you as host to butcher his name. Do you want to give it a go? Uh, Saeed Ezatulahi, I believe. Yes, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, he's a, he's a ball winning midfielder. Yeah, well, apparently he's a big, strong, physical lad, um, as Clement described in his post-match to BBC Barks, that's going to come in and disrupt the play. So, I suppose that does go back to the point that Kelly and Swift are those creative options. And again, they're not doing it. So what do you do? You've got to go back to the two that helped you win a point at Villa Park, even if creatively they're not going to give you that magic. So if they're creatively not going to give you that magic, why is it that at the first goal, we kind of lose two 50-50 challenges in our own half, having given the ball away. We lose a runner from deep. Then we leave absolute as much space as you, three players lining up to shoot from the 18-yard line, as much space as they could have possibly wanted. And we've just said that we're playing two centre midfielders who are of the more defensive ilk, and yet they couldn't prevent that first goal against Sheffield Wednesday. Million dollar question, isn't it? I, I've got absolutely no idea. I suppose, I think it was Aluko and Gunter involved in that first one. Uh, you could, I suppose, give Gunter a little bit of a pass for, well, not a pass, but you could understand the hesitation just coming back into the team, maybe a couple of that injury sort of playing on his mind. Aluko, we know he's completely shot of confidence, so his chances of going in and winning 50-50s at the moment are limited. Uh, and from that, I'd say, rabbits in headlights, maybe it's people not fully sure of their roles. Again, maybe it's people lacking that confidence to go, I'm going to get in there. Uh, I'm not supposed to be there right now, but I need to be in there. When you are so low on confidence, you're desperate to to stick to a plan. You're desperate to do the the basics really right. And so maybe you're not using your brain as much, uh, having never been a top level footballer, yet alone being a, I was never even a top five aside footballer. I can't really comment, but from afar, that's what I assume goes through your mind. And I only go back to you know, you go back to that Stam era and one of the things for me, having watched on for these past couple of, even the good season we had under Yap, players don't seem to take the initiative themselves. Under Stam, I thought that was down to maybe a fear, a fear factor that if I don't do my job, I'm going to lose my place in the team. Now, I think it's a case of, oh God, I don't want to be that person that makes the mistake. And at least if I stick to the plan, I'm not going to get yelled at. Does that make sense? I can see where you're coming from in the sense that it is that it's the blame game that shifts around. Is are you blamed because you're the one that that did too much or the one that did too little? And exactly. I think players at the moment are perhaps being scared of doing too much, and that's reflected in the fact we're playing a very basic four four two. Precisely. So, I'm I'm happy we're playing a very basic four four two. It does a lot of teams a lot of good, but you have to get the basics really right, and you have to come out the other side of testing moments in games. 
and I wouldn't usually describe the first 15 seconds after the break as a testing moment in a game. And yet Reading, not just the first 15 seconds, but the general like period, 5-10 minutes after the, the break, is becoming really difficult to get through. And it took Sheffield Wednesday just 15 seconds. I mean, I've kind of described the goal as thus. David Myler watches Barry Bannon, who's a creative midfielder, come forward, doesn't get near him. The ball is played into Adam Reach. He's got no pressure on him. He passes the ball off. And if you actually watch Reach's run, he turns Elori. He's gone. If, if someone wants him in the box, he's there. But it's not needed because the goal scorer, Zhao, has all the time. And it's a nice finish. And I'm not going to blame Vita Manoni for either goals because they're good strikes of the ball. Sometimes you get that. But it's once again, it's just a porous nature of the Reading team that it, it, it should be clearly dealt with with the system that we're playing in. But we're seeing it as fans and we can see this problem. Everybody can see this problem that we're giving away too many goals straight after the break. The players are obviously going to have it in their head. They're going to be doing the analysis and the research. And sometimes it's that negativity equals negativity. The slight hesitation, the, again, the, oh God, I know we've got to keep it tight. So what am I doing? And that sort of overanalyzing things. And the psychological blow when you see a guy finish like that, it's, it's just got to be crippling. It really does. You know, you think, right, you know, we're into this. Let's just keep it tight. And then boom, straight away. <sighs> again, it's not particularly defensible, but I'm starting to feel quite sorry for this team because you go back and some of the comments you see on social media at the moment are so ridiculous. I'm going to use it ridiculously harsh. The people that accuse the players of not trying, I don't think are watching the right game because I look at that and I see every single person trying. I do see a lot of people completely out of confidence, but I see a lot of people damn well trying. And you look at the the chase and the heart and the fight they gave it when we were 2-1 down, when they were free, because that was the only time in the game where they felt free to completely go for it, I think. And they had that little bit of confidence from the goal. And if Reading played like that, the way they did in the last 15, 20 minutes, every game for the championship season, yeah, they would lose, probably lose a lot because they get caught a lot on the break, but they would go and win quite a few games. They would get themselves into leads. And hopefully, I just hope that they take that and Clement shows them that last 20 minutes rather than worrying too much about all the cock-ups before that. Get them to watch that last 20 minutes. Get them to listen to how the crowd got behind them because that's all fans want to see. Well, I think certainly that, that it is kind of 2-0 football in a sense, but he certainly had it against Watford as well. The last 10 minutes against Watford, Liam Kelly in particular had a great chance. And as, as I mentioned before, we're going to sort of merge the mailbag into everything this week. And Ryan Jeffrey sent in the question saying, was selling George Evans the wrong decision? The two goals we conceded on Saturday showed we have no one protecting the defensive line who was roughly where they should be, but the midfield couldn't offer protection, possibly due to lack of mobility or lack of concentration. I mean, I can't, I'm not going to say that Leandro Bakun or David Myler have a particular lack of mobility, lack of concentration, no, I kind of agree with. George Evans, when we were criticising the Reading team of last year, doing conceding pretty much the same sort of goals we're conceding now, not tracking runners, not being uh, particularly aware of the players around them. George Evans, I think, was as guilty as anyone. So I'm not p- particularly sure that he would have you know, remedied the situation one, single-handedly. I, I completely agree. I, you know, I've said you go back and listen to the shows. You know, when I was on the podcast before. George Evans is a very good 6 out of 10 player. You know what you're going to get from George Evans. And yeah, can he do a job in front of the fence? Sure. But he's not going to do that much better a job than a David Myler who's on form, a Bakuna that's on form, a Dave Edwards when he comes back fit. But he just you, you can't go and carry all these players. Clement said, I've got 30 players. And he said, that's too many. You can't just keep them all just in case all these players don't find form. Because he was still, realistically, third or fourth choice down the pecking order. Uh, I, I, you, Reading needs to get away from signing players that are just okay that are just there and that's what George Evans was maybe he's going to go prove us all wrong at Derby but from having watched him for what two and a half three seasons he was at Reading did we ever see apart from that one playoff game really excellent stuff from George Evans no we just saw decent to good so selling him especially where the club comes in with a money offer for him was a no-brainer so I, I can't say that's the wrong decision at all it's not just because if George Evans was here, doesn't mean he's going to play any better. 
than the players that are currently off form at the moment. And I certainly think in terms of an overall package, I don't think George Evans offers any more than, as I said, if you get a Myler on form, if you get a Bakuna on form, if you get Dave Edwards back or so on. Or a new signing. No, but that's the thing. I, I'm not sure that George Evans is... If, if we're talking about someone who's going to sort of shake up players, and maybe it's a bit simplistic to say that we need leaders and, and those sort of things are going to change things. Either way, George Evans isn't, for me, that sort of player. And final thing I want to touch on on the recap, uh, based on the Sheffield Wednesday game, is Paul Clement's role in, in changing games as they sort of... I mean, as obviously in the selection as well, but as they move on, he, he made a triple substitute against Sheffield Wednesday, which is pretty, um, I mean, it's pretty unhealthy ter- territory for a lot of Reading managers and a lot of managers generally these days. He talks with conviction to the media, which I like, but there are sort of no results. And just touching on his selection again, there's very few academy players getting a chance and it seems like it's obvious that he's not going to be able to settle on the best team when no one's playing well, but it's kind of difficult to get a grip on what he wants his team to look like as much as anything else? I, I think you know what he wants his team to look like. I think he wants he wants a couple of wing-backs that are happy to get forward and support the attack. He wants two solid defenders who aren't uncomfortable on the ball. He wants a good creative midfielder alongside a, a sort of stopper or a destroyer, two decent wingers, and he wants to form a partnership with two players up front. He keeps, as Reading managers have been, it seems, for the last four or five years, Keeps getting unlucky with injuries, suspensions, unavailabilities. We can we can dissect the decision of whether Blackett should have come into the team or not, but I don't think little decisions. I don't think those are the sort of little decisions that are, are costing us games at the moment. You, you've got to try and f- find a team that you have that confidence in and that is fulfilling all the roles and fulfilling your tactical plan. And obviously, he saw Chris Gunter. And down to the right, or when he switched him over to the left, as someone that was going to be more able to do that, and Tyler Blackett. And I think if you do look in isolation, who would you rather have? You know, Yidam and, and Gunter, or Yidam and Blackett. I think most fans would say Gunter is. You want Gunter in the team, and you want Yidam because he's, he's done nothing wrong, and he's probably been our player of the season so far. So, yeah, in terms of academy players, that is a tricky one because. I certainly don't get to see the under-23s. Very few fans do, but Paul Clement presumably does. His coaches presumably do. If there's nobody stepping up, he, he can't just pick them. There's obviously something that's not... You know, you look at um, an Omar Richards, who's now been overlooked, or, you know, other people have been picked ahead of him by two different managers and that's always the acid test for me. You can always sort of tell when, OK, maybe one man. But we saw this with Dom Samuel, didn't we, Mark? You know, we looked for years and fans were saying, oh, why isn't Dom Samuel in the team? Why isn't Dom Samuel in the team? After McDermott gave him that one game at Sunderland, Dom Samuel comes into the team and everyone goes, oh, that's why Dom Samuel wasn't in the team. So <laughs> I'm not saying that's the case for every player in the academy. But, but, but without that, then you don't you don't know. I mean, I like to I like I'm happy to reach that conclusion. Oh, that's why he's not in the team. But you need to get to that. Yeah, point. but you need to get there, don't you? Well, by that argument, put me up front and then prove that I'm not a good striker. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, uh, probably too extreme an example. Although I do, <laughs> you know, I do think I could get myself. Actually, I can't get myself around the box very well. I could stay in the box, you know, and you gave me a chair or something. Um, <laughs> it. it you look at these players and you have to base it on what you see. And if he's looking at these under 23s, and I cannot believe that Clement is sitting there watching these academy players in training, watching them in under 23 games. He saw a few of them in preseason. I can't believe that there is a player there that he's not picking if they could do a job, especially with the form we're in. Because he knows that fans and everyone would give academy players a lot more leeway. There's got to be a good reason for it. I, you know, otherwise what are we saying that there's some sort of conspiracy are we saying that he just doesn't like academy players i'm i'm as disappointed as anyone that you know we're not seeing this conveyor belt come through from the academy but if you haven't got the players available to you what can what can you do well we'll touch on the academy in a little bit in a bit more depth but i think i'd probably end this bit by saying that for me at the moment it's the case that we are so desperate for wins that is the 
the catalyst of stopping the academy coming through. And, and any team, you know, Paul Clement comes from Chelsea. If Chelsea gave a manager five years and said, you know what, we don't need to win the, the Premier League for the next three, then he, they'd probably have their best academy in the country who probably produced five or six first-team players. But in the similar set, state, the owners want promotion and the reality is that we're have to, having to battle relegation. Those two factors aren't conducive to saying, you know what, it's three years, go and play Omar Richards every week. And Omar Richards, he's fifth-choice left-back now, isn't he? He's behind Blackett, Yadom, Gunter and Dobita in reality yeah. terms. So it's... Uh, it's hard to see where he'll get back into the team, and maybe. It's and he's had a low move. He's had ten. He's had ten first team starts. So we've got now the best part of what is that? You know, best part of th- 12, 13, 14 hours of football that you can judge and Richards on. And and you know, again, maybe he, can, he will come good in the future. But there are very few right now that are screaming, "Get that guy in the team!" Because I think if there were, and it was even close. I think they would be in the team right now because, as I said, he's given those other, he's given the senior players a go round, and everyone's on their second and third chances already. So it just to me seems that either he doesn't think they're ready yet, or that the talent is not just there. I mean, and I, I wouldn't like to say which one it is because because I, I don't get to see them enough. No, hopefully we'll uh, we'll get some answers to that as we move forward then over the season, and hopefully we will be in that position, that kind of sweet spot. Not that sweet, but still decent enough compared to where we are at the moment where we're not too worried about promotional relegation where we can start blooding some of these youngsters and finding out exactly how good they are. And as I say, the Academy will be one of the topics that comes up in the pub chat, which is coming up now as we deliver our State of Reading FC address. The Tarlhurst End Podcast. By Reading fans, for Reading fans. I was reading in the Metro this morning, Dan, about a new show that the journalist Jeremy Vine is hosting. And I'm not going to say the uh, the channel because there's certainly other channels and better channels available. But I was Absolutely. kind of intrigued by the fact that the tagline for this was that he's going to tear the news apart and find out what the heck is going on. <laughs> and what I want us to do now is tear Reading FC apart and find out what the heck is going on. And my opening Sounds question, like Christmas. My opening question to you is what is the point of Reading FC at this moment in time? Oh, to uh, make my Saturday afternoons miserable, it seems. Um, <laughs> the, the point of Reading Football Club at the moment should be uh, building a base to get this football club into the Premier League and grow from there. We've always you talk to anybody and you say Reading Football Club has a tremendous amount of potential. You look at the catchment area of win, the sort of affluent area as well of fans. And we've got a pedigree and a history. You know, we take... 40,000 odd to Wembley every time we get there so this club has massive potential what it is what the point of it is I don't think anybody sitting there saying Reading FC is going to be a a tremendous business anytime soon I don't think very few football clubs ever turn into massive great big financial uh, money makers so I don't think we're looking at like that but we are looking at a team that has a potential and has a pedigree and a fairly recent history of being a Premier League side and that is the point that should be the point. The other point seems to be that these owners and the previous owners before them, or at least some part of that previous ownership group decided that they want Reading football club to play an attractive possession based football style. So that's it. Play that style, get in the premier league and hopefully win the fans back. That would be from afar. What I see the point of Reading being. I must admit, I've never been fond of the idea that owners would have a, particular style of football and that's not because I perceive any owners of football clubs to be like illegitimate or ill-informed in terms of their football as far as I can tell Di Young and Di Julie our current Reading FC owners watch as, as many games probably even more games than I do of, of the, of the Medeski Stadium and it, the ownership is the first thing I want to tackle here and it boils down to to the, the commitment to passing football, which I think has been mentioned enough in the media to be considered a, a thing, an actual material substance around the club. And secondly, the sense of investment, because it's really hard to work out, is it actually there or not? And the problem is, for me, with criticising the owners for a supposed lack of investment, is that it actually does seem like there is genuine investment being put into the team, by the way of Thiago Valori, Sonia Luco, Sam Baldock, all of which have been made in the absence of player sales, which Liam Moore has has been denied the opportunity to become a player sale and make some money for the club. So if there is if there is investment, 
And, you know, this this commitment to passing football is kind of, it's neither here nor there in a large sense, and it's, it's very difficult to get a grasp of. How do you criticise the owners of this club? I think the only criticism you can make of them is uh, about who they have entrusted to make decisions on various areas, whether that is on the commercial side, whether it's on the playing side, whether it's in the sort of management side of things. Because like you say, the investment's there. So I, I'm not going to have any of this, oh, they're not putting money into the club. There's progress being made on the training ground. There is clearly, as you say, money being put into the squad, not just in terms of transfer fee, but more importantly, wages. Certainly because the very fact that now the Football League is very keen to punish those who fail financial fair play. And you just have to look at the fact that we're paying 30 odd professionals, most of whom are experienced championship professionals, to know that our wage bill, as it has been actually for most of the past five, six years, is going to be one of the highest in the division. So somebody's underwriting that because crowds are down. We're not selling players anymore. You know, we're not selling the, the five, six million pound player every summer, the Shane Long, the Matt Mills, the Kevin Doyle. That's gone. So where's the money coming from? It's obviously coming from the pockets of our owners or else we're being a transfer embargo right now. So they're putting money in. The question is, do you, are they putting the money into the right places and are they giving the right people the, you know, are, are they giving that money to the right people to spend? That is something that, you know, we can only judge over a long period of time. Uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and call out anyone in particular. So I'm not going to say, oh, it's Ron Corley's fault. They shouldn't have appointed him. It's not, oh, you know, it's Brian Tavraden's fault. It's Paul Clement's fault. It's X, Y and Z's fault. I don't know. Because for all, you know, for all we know, Mark, it's the owners themselves who are saying, go and sign this player who turns out to be not what they hope or we're not going to sign this player, you know, X and Y. So it's, you know, I tweeted after the game on Saturday. I don't think it's fair to blame any one party in this, I think, because that way it lets somebody else hide. You know, if we go and say, oh, it's all it's all Ron Gourlay's fault or it's all Paul Clement's fault, then that lets the other people shy away from their responsibility. So certainly I think the owners are supporting the football club, but then it's the question of does that need refining? Do they need to readdress where that money is going? Well, one man who was certainly never taking responsibility for the signings that came in and out of the club was Yap Stam. He always made very clear that he was uh, he was not the man to talk to about signings. If you had any piece of gossip you asked him about, he'd always say no. Go and talk to Brian Tevraden or or someone else because he was always he was clearly the coach and Paul Clement seems to me to be a kind of coach man as well. Maybe that's just looking at his his past as an assistant and whatnot and kind of boiling it down a little too much. But nonetheless, it certainly uh, certainly seems to be a case that people in the past have shaken their or brushed their hands off it. Shall we say some fans are. Opinions that they've sent into the Tyler stand after the game. Helen Bullen said the club went downhill after Medeski sold to the Russian Anton Tingavich. A short, unexpected sojourn into the Premier League. But the connection to the fans started to go after Brian McDermott was sacked. Succession of other foreign owners with no respect for the fans or the heritage of the club. They're all in it for the money and what they can squeeze out of a former rubbish dump on RG2. Perhaps referencing the fact that the former Thai owners of the club still, um, I believe, have the Royal Elm Park finger in that particular pie for around the stadium. Loyal Royal said that my main concern is where are the owners and what are their intentions. Club feels directionless, no connection with the higher management, uh, such as Ron Gourlay. Clement has not done anything to convince me either way at the moment. Obviously, home results this season must improve. I would say, to bring that one up, the connection with the higher management and sort of the, the intentions of the club, are we kind of spoiled as Reading fans because we've had this this kind of nostalgic yesteryear era of John Medeski's ownership, but it wasn't nostalgic in yesteryear. It was only a couple of years, or maybe probably about six years ago now that he actually left, but every fan can remember that period. So it was kind of an old-fashioned period. Certainly now it's an old-fashioned period of ownership. And yet, because it was so recent, we perhaps as Reading fans, we think that it's the norm. Yeah, look, we're right to look back uh, nostalgically. Uh, Sir John's reign because it was the best period the football club has ever had and historically it was the dream scenario you had the local businessman with the town at heart who was just happy to hand over his money to get the club you know as successful as could be we saw it with you know Sir Jack Hayward down at Wolves we saw it with Jack Walker at Blackburn modern comparison would be you know a Steve Gibson or even a Sheikh Mansour 
at Man City. That's the dream. That's what anybody wants is this figure that is happy to pump constant money into the club, but not get too involved and let the manager and, and, and or a director of football partnership get on with it. And we had that with the pillars that were Sir John, Nick Hammond and Steve Coppola and then Brian McDermott. Dream, dream scenario. It wasn't all great under... John Badesky, you look at the failure that was the, the Tommy Burns experiment um, and the, the early seasons of strife at the Mad Stad. So, you know, Sir John didn't always get it right. I think he he's admitted readily on many, many occasions that he's not a football man. He puts his trust in other people and sometimes that trust wasn't rewarded. What we've had now, in, 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 you know, you look at what Helen said, has the club gone downhill since Anton Zagarevich took over? Well, yeah, absolutely, because... You know, we've been on a steady downhill climb ever since, albeit, you know, we were in that amazing position of being a couple of penalty kicks away from the Premier League. And maybe this isn't a conversation we're having at all. But I think you look infrastructure wise, the club doesn't seem too much worse off. In fact, if this training ground development goes ahead, we're actually doing quite well. The stadium is still looking nice and shiny. Um, As you said, we're, we're signing players. We're spending more than ever before on footballers. So... In a lot of ways, the club is actually going forward. But again, I go back to, has the money been spent in the right place? Have the right decisions been taken? And just based solely on what's happening on the pitch at the moment would lead you to say no. Let's get the final opinion for this little segment. Before we go on, I want to go and talk about the uh, the sort of more specific management of Gourlay and whatnot. But Arthur Withers uh, tweeted us in saying, No doubt all the basics and we see pieces of work on the training ground and the coaching is of a good level, but it's now the mental approach over the white line that needs to, needs to be sorted. I do not hold Clement responsible for he is the wrong manager at the wrong time. With the lack of confidence and inability to do the basics, right, we need a motivator. Remember how Mad Dog changed our fortunes and... I think to, with the, the owners, it's hard to know whether the owners were the people who brought in Clement and, and whatnot, and the, the training ground, as you say, is going ongoing. Between now and the end of the season, taking the, the results and the off the pitch sort of, or on the pitch to put, to put it one, to one side, what do you want to see the owners do? do you, are you happy with them being quiet and quietly seemingly putting money in? and remaining in the state they're in in spite of the fact that it hasn't produced results on the pitch or do you want to see them come out and and be more public because we had the tie owners come out and be quite public and it didn't work for me it I wasn't it didn't sit right with me to you know the things like the song and god knows what else there was but the chinese owners aren't like that do you do you want that to change or are you you satisfied well look you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't because You know, look at Singarevich. He said all of the right things, didn't he? He was front and centre at the director's box. He was talking up Elm Park and this and that and the other. And we know what happened there. With the tie owners, you know, you hit on it. We had Lady Sassima, bless her, and her song and things like that. And, (laughs) you know, being on the pitch and all that jazz, that didn't go well. Then Tiger came in and I sat in a meeting with Tiger, uh, not just myself. There was a, a group of fans and he said all the right things. He taught such a good game. He talked about players that he was watching and this, that and the other. And that he's gone off and he's trying to work his magic at Oxford now. Yet on the other hand, you know, you get the silent owners like we've had now and people aren't happy either. I, I think they need to make a little bit more of a public show. And I think Ron Gourlay did an interview over the summer sort of saying, look, it would make my job easier. Um, if the owners came out a little bit more and and spoke to the fans. But if they don't want to do that, I don't think them speaking to us in public is making the blindest bit of difference. It was hinted on by, you know, Loyal Royal, talking about the the, the connection with the higher management. That's what matters. It's whether the owners are actively auditing where their money's going and are confident that they've appointed the right people and that those people they've appointed are making the right decisions for this football club, because that is what matters most. They can pour as much money as they want in, but if they've got the wrong people making those decisions, it's just going to go completely tits up. So all our, all I think as fans that we want to know is that they are aware of what's going on at the football club, that they're not completely absentee, like you say, that they are watching games, that they can see what's going on and that they're having regular meetings, not just with one person. Again, I'm not here to bash Ron Gourlay, but 
it would be nice to know that the Chinese owners are speaking to the head of the media department, the head of the academy, the head of, you know, Paul Clement, maybe to Clement's system, maybe to players, getting opinions from everybody to sort of make sure the club is going in the right direction. Are they doing that? We don't know. But I like to think that because they're very successful business people, hence why they've got the money to pump into the club, that they're going to be doing that. Yeah, and it's, it, it comes back, you say you're not here to bash one call, it moves us on quite nicely to the to the point of who they have put in, in place to uh, to manage the club. Nathan Bowell tweeted us saying, Gourlay and Teverdom, get rid of both of them. They're both as incompetent as each other. Waldemar Janajak says, is it a coincidence that the club decline in Reading's fortunes coincides exactly with the arrival of Ron Gourlay as CEO? Remember, he arrived in July 2017 just after the bouncy combination of Stam, Teverdon and Howe took Reading to within a penalty kick of the Premier League. And the thing is with Gourlay is that the th- we, we don't know, as you kind of alluded to earlier, we don't know exactly what he's done, but we do know what's changed since he's come in. And there's been longer contracts for players who have signed up and who have signed renewals. The kind of random signings from all over the place, however, has continued. And for me, this is this surely must be a Tevredon policy because it didn't happen before him and it has continued amid Gourlay, or in spite of Gourlay, you could say. We can't our signings from the, which is the cause of the upper, um, upper management, as far as I can tell. It's so much hit and miss for me. It seems like there's very poor contacts being utilised by whoever's signing players. Obviously, Ezra Talahi, the uranium midfielder, could turn out to be the best signing in the world. But the players who we've signed over the last 18, 24 months, we've had these useless Dutch players come in, such as Pella Clement from this Dutch agency, and Sandro Weisser and Danzel Gravenberch, all who were part of the same agency, that we seem to have a good contact with that agency. But we're competing in a league with George Mendes's Wolves, who are signing immeasurably better players with immeasurably better contacts. Back in the days of, of even Steve Clark and Brian McDermott, they had good contacts they could go to. They knew players they were fond of from previous managements and previous jobs they could bring in. We don't have any of that anymore. Yeah, but if, this is why I will give Von Gaulle a little bit of you know, leeway, because like you say, he didn't go and sign Joseph Mendes. He didn't go sign Graven Birch. And before him, look at the sheer ridiculous amount of loans that Steve Clark had. You know, who went out and signed Dennis Rackles, for example? Was that this nice? has been go Yeah, this has been going on for a long time. So I don't think it's fair just to say our transfer policy is naff because Ron Gourlay's come in. You go back to the contract issue. A lot of the contracts made sense at the time. You know, John Swift at the time could get him locked up. He's playing well. Same with Liam Kelly. Same with Liam Moore, although he's now had to have another new contract. Um, was it right to, to, to keep Kermgen on again after the season he had? That made sense. Same with McCleary. It's really easy to look back and go, oh, these contracts were naff. But at the time, you go back and look at the, the reaction from the majority of fans, and a lot of them would have said that made sense. So contract-wise, just because they've gone bad, doesn't mean that they weren't good decisions at the time. Um, I'm not saying every one of those was a great decision, but I think on the vast majority, they've actually have been logical and, and they've had good sense behind them. Uh, and then you go to recruitment and the sheer number of players that have been brought in. Like I said earlier in the show and, and Clement said after the game, he's got 30 players, Mark. 30 players to choose from. So how is it that we can't find 11 that are on the right path now to me this all comes back down to the greater million dollar question and we've had a lot of million dollar questions today actually someone's (laughs) going to be quite rich if they can answer all these but who exactly is signing off on these is it the chinese owners is it gourlay is it tavraden is it clement or is there a chief scout is this even somebody else in this picture until one until we know that for sure and we probably are never going to know it until one manager comes out you know, years down the line and write source of biography. We're not going to know who's making these signings. Is it, or is it a combination? Is it, oh, will you sign a player? I'll sign a player. That's for me is the, is the concerning point because I don't know where authority lies. We touched on it earlier with Yap Stam saying, well, I, you know, don't talk to me about signings, which possibly suggests it's not the manager. But at the same point, when we do sign a player, Clement often talks about how he likes his player. 
So he's not exactly distancing himself either. So no, no. And it's, just, it's hard for I think it's hard for a manager as well because you're in the media, you're playing that sort of balancing role. What you say in the media is often completely different to what you'll say in the dressing room. And if you go and and publicly slate a signing who's not yours, you've got to go and talk to that player afterwards and you've got to go and, and find a way of playing them to get results because after all you're not there to a dodge play you yeah. are there to get results exactly you've got to deal the best with the players you've got and increasingly in modern football now it's a head coach it's not really a manager you know Tony Pulis takes or did take great pride in being a head coach making it very clear that he was no longer a manager and that's what we've got you know Paul Clement is a manager in name but realistically it seems on the you know so the anecdotes and the nuggets of info we do get that he is not the one that is making these decisions exactly. I'm sure he's got an input and he's got a say in them, but I get the feeling it's not Clement who's ultimately deciding who is coming and going. And then that leads to the question of again we go back to well is it Tavraden? Is it Tavraden that needs to pay the price for these signings being naff, or is it the manager's fault for not getting enough out of these players? Or is it Gorlo's fault for sanctioning them? Is it the Chinese's fault? I know we're sort of going around a, a mini bit in circles, but that is, I think, what is frustrating Reading fans more than anything, is that we don't really know. It's like you've got a leak. You've got a leak somewhere in the house. You can see water dripping down, but you don't know where it's coming from. And that is a really frustrating thing for us all at the moment. It's not... Oftentimes, you you know, in the past, you could say, oh, it's the manager's fault. He's not getting the most out. Oh, it's the chairman's fault. He's not putting his hand in his pocket. And this scenario, I don't know about you, but I have no idea who to really sit there and go, it's your fault. I think that's kind of summed up as well in what Guy Jay has sent to us. He, he says that he thinks it's unfair people blaming Clement. We were rubbish before he came in. My, his Guy Jay's blame is Gourlay. He said in an interview with Tim Deller that he was running the club now. And Clement also said that he couldn't shift out some players. Who were they? Well, I mean, probably all the ones that he's not playing. Clive Ratton has said that Reading are like any other business going through a bad time. And any turnaround needs leadership, a vision and togetherness we seem to lack all of them the good news is that it can change quickly it just needs a leader to stand up and rally the troops question is who is that leader and we'll move on to the academy in a short while but the final question i want to have on this is you can answer it yes or no if you really want before and it's because it'll kind of be mean sacking two people but if i offered you the chance to now refresh and remove Gourlay and Teverden and say, you know what, maybe you were doing some good things, but we just need a refreshment of, of faces running the club. Would you take that? I, it sounds like a cop-out, but I, I honestly don't know because we could get rid of them both and it could be more of the same. As I said, it, and as, you know, as, as Guy wrote, it, it, it needs a vision. It needs a vision from, uh, sorry, that Clive said, it needs a vision. And until we know who that vision is coming from, I think it's I don't think it's fair to say that person needs to pay the price. That person needs to pay the price. If you did get rid of them both, it would certainly leave Paul Clement nowhere to hide and it would leave the owners nowhere to hide. So if you were being completely cutthroat and methodical, you could say, well, OK, well, that that would answer the question of whether it's their fault or not. So. Look, are we at the absolute desperation stage where that needs to happen? I don't think we're there yet, but it is it is getting very it is getting closer to that point where you need to do something drastic. But I do think that six games into the season, with players to come back in, players to get back into form, I don't think it's completely worth pushing that great big red panic button just yet. So, yeah, if you put a gun to my head, I would say no. But I think every one of those four sort of power brokers is on the hot stove. And I don't think that, I think if any one of them were to lose, obviously the owners aren't going to lose their job. But if any one of those other three were to lose their job, I don't think they could sit there and say, I've been, you know, I, I feel very, very hard done by. It's probably at the end of the season, I would say, is, is the ideal time to do those sort of changes. Because even at, at this stage of the season, I don't think you can, you can sack someone of that authority and not expect a little bit of blowback in terms of the structure of the club being shaken up by a new person. Those things have effects and often they're negative in the short term and positive in the long term. And Reading can't afford any more short term negatives. That's certainly not something that we can play with. And that links into the fact of the academy at the moment. The question, <laughs> the million dollar question of the academy is, is it really that good? 
I think the aim, the loss of Eamon Dole and God, God rest his soul is still being keenly felt. There's, it probably is the one turning point you could say that has sort, sort of moved the academy from being a, a brilliant, promising academy to just being a good, promising academy. We have English youth internationals, so why? the question is why not just throw them in? And let's say, here's another hypothetical, let's say we survive and we're 20th or whatever it is to just survive and, and Paul Clement leaves. Would you bring in a coach with the specific mandate of saying, you know what, don't worry about the results for the six, first six months of the season, focus on that academy? Because I think that a lot of fans would definitely take that and say, you know what, don't worry about the, well, if we're 23rd, we'll stick it through. And there are, you know, there's a good six or seven players there that you could hypothetically throw in and, and you know, see what happens. You could. You absolutely could. But is there any guarantee it would either be good for the club long term or any actually more in, exciting to watch? You know, and I've sat there at times thinking, no, oh, just... You know, just play the kids. It's great to get behind them. But look, it's not a participation sport. And we're not. If you want to go and see the academy and support the academy, go watch under 23 games because you can give them your support. You can give them your backing in that environment when they're not playing behind closed doors. The only reason that you would necessarily do that in terms of, OK, your mandate is to bring people through the academy is if you have an academy that is pumping out great player after great player after great player and they're not getting a look in. This, again, doesn't feel like this scenario because how many of these players are getting snapped up by big, good clubs on loan? Now, with the exception, I think we've got, what, Tenai Watson, who's out at Wimbledon. We've got uh, Novakovic, who's doing really well in Holland. He looks like he could be a real, real good one. And that's probably the only one you could say, well, why was he let go? But apart from that, there's not. I mean, Sam Smith's at Oxford and he's getting hooked and, and taken off most games. There doesn't seem to be this clamour to get rid players. And the ones that have sort of got away, maybe Jake Cooper, maybe Tariq Fosu. The rest, Dom Samuel's not doing great. He's injured again at Blackburn. All of these players you can go back and look over. You look at that Premier League Cup winning side from, what was it, 2014? How many of those are really making a massive difference out there now? Um so, yeah, I would certainly like more to come in, but it goes back to what I said at the top of the show. If they're not good enough and you don't see a realistic ability growth in them, there's no point playing them for the sake of it just to say, oh, well, we're playing academy players. We saw this, Mark. We saw this, was it 2014-15 with Nigel Adkins? Well, we, he gave loads of academy players a chance. We saw it with Brendan Rodgers in 2009-2010, you know, when he threw the likes of Scott Davis, Alex Pearce, Julian Kelly, players like that, all into the mix. And the football was bad. On both occasions, we were struggling down at the very foot of the table and fans were getting really annoyed. Uh, that's not revisionist history. You look at attendances and you look at what fans were saying at the time, they weren't massively happy. So I don't see why that would necessarily be any different today. And that, um, and that sort of period as well of, of putting players in and you know, losing losing games perhaps as a result, but certainly losing games alongside putting players, and that was a it was an excuse, wasn't it? There was the club saying, yeah. "Well, you know, we've, it's our fiftieth academy player has, has made this fiftieth <laughs> start, or whatever." And saying, "Well, yeah, that's great. We've just lost two one at home to Barnsley, and I'm not really very <laughs> fond of that." So, it is, yeah, it is. It's it's also for me as well. You can ruin a player's career by putting him into a bad team and watching him fail. And then yeah. saying, well, he's not good enough. And then shipping him off to, you know, uh, Burton or something and he does badly at Burton. And then he goes to National League, etc. It spirals out of control for them. Look at him, Darren Cool. Exactly. If- Perfect example. Played that first half of that season. Didn't cut it. Was then sent off, what, to Dundee, was it, I think? Mm, yeah. Then Boreham Wood. Then just released. Uh, and then he looks like he's been blighted by injury since. And there's never... And that was a player that was being talked about as being watched by Man City, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. At was, one yeah. stage. And that was a player, I watched him in the away game at Brentford and he was hopeless. I think he was at fault for one of the goals. We got beat 3-1. Um, and like you say, those type of experiences could just ruin a prospect. So why do it to them? Why, you know, for the sake of what we talked about at the top of the show, well, you can say, oh, well, you know, we've tried him. If the manager is watching him on a regular basis and sort of has that knowledge and what his coach is and his academy coach are presumably telling him as well, this guy's not ready. 
then don't do it to him. You're not desperate. You've got 30 players in your squad. Surely you're going to be able to find a combination without having to run the risk of, of ruining your top prospects. Yeah, and some thoughts from Reading fans saying Chris Squire saying he'd like to see you've given a chance in favour of the likes of Manoni, Gunter, Aluko and Bulldog. Time for Ward or Walker, Richards or Watson, Rinham, Hota and Loder. As you just said, then, Dan, that those Manoni, Gunter, Aluko and Bulldog, you've paid over £10 million, over £15 million probably for those players. And shoving them out for players who have played maybe 10 first-team appearances, it's not... It's not necessarily the the route to victory on paper, at least. We obviously know that that theory and and results are very different. Tom Harris Smith said, any idea if we have a recall option on Novakovic's loan, the same way Southampton have one for Sims in January? We don't know that. I don't know that. Um, It's I mean, it's certainly something to keep an eye on because he is scoring goals in the Dutch top flight, and that is something that you cannot overlook. And I don't think the club would be stupid enough to overlook it either. Um, hopefully we'll see Novakovic given a chance at Reading in the next 6 or 12 months. Thomas says AD Williams said he thought that the problem wasn't a lack of effort or desire on the part of the players, but a lack of quality. Do you agree? I think there is a lack of quality. There's no doubt about that. And with the academy question, quality isn't necessarily the thing that you get when you bring academy players into the team. I think that someone like Danny Loder has a lot of quality in him, given that he's playing for England's youth teams. But... You tend to, when you bring academy players in, you tend to do it to bring in a bit more effort, a bit more ruggedness to your team, perhaps players that are going to run harder and and pick themselves up for three games a week a little bit better. That's not necessarily what Reading are lacking at the moment. Yeah, and look, I'm, I'm not bashing these young players, but there is such a massive step up and difference in quality, even playing international youth level football I think Dom Samuel played youth international football mm. you go back in time Nathan Tyson did the same Reading have had lots of people I think do you remember was it Jack Mills I think he used to play for England under 19s mm. or was it or was he another Joseph Angus Mills Angus McDonald did as well I think lots of these players uh, McDonald's actually a good story because he's someone that's risen back up through the ranks but Reading have had a lot of youth international players over there Zach Jules I think was off playing for Scotland under 21s mm all these players but making that step up is massive and I don't think we could have had Shane Long Kevin Doyle Dave Kitson up front for us on Saturday and that wouldn't have made the difference Strike is not going to make the massive difference so I don't see why throwing Danny Loder into we saw it with Sam Smith last season plenty of heart but ultimately if you're not getting the chances or you're only getting one chance a game you're soon just going to get yourself into a rut and again is that going to be more detrimental to your development it, you know Ward or Walker for a goalkeeper. I certainly think either one could come in for Manone. Again, I don't think Manone has done badly, but he's not doing amazingly. Um, and are Richards and Watson going to do any better? Well, Richards has had a chance already this season, hasn't done brilliantly. Tony Watson's already out on loan. Hopefully, he has a good first six months of the season. Like Novakovic, you could sit there in January, like we did with Michael Hector. Michael Hector went off and had that great first half of the season at Aberdeen, didn't he? And we got him back in January um, and did really well. So hopefully with Novakovic and Watson, if they do, and Sam Smith, if they all perform well, January is the time to get them back in. Um, So, and yeah, as far as Tom said with his question about AD, I I said it earlier in the show, I do think there is plenty of effort going in. It's just quality and finding that right combo. And on the quality front, the last question before we uh, move away from the academy is from Dave Erm, and he says, is Liam Kelly the new Howe Robson Carnu? Got ability but cannot recognise when he's clearly out of form and doesn't adapt, just carries on trying the same stuff, such as pointless flicks, comes across as lacking intelligence and maturity, like Howe Robson Carnu thinks he is better than he is and gives just as boring an interview, which uh, <laughs> is, a, is a unique uh, complaint about a player, I'll certainly admit, and I'm not going to argue with it too much, but... The Kelly, I'm not, I'm not going to start renaming the Howell Robson Carney Underachievement Award the Liam Kelly Underachievement <laughs> Award anytime soon. But, I mean, that is kind of... Liam Kelly, the thing is for me, he did come from nowhere. He certainly wasn't one of those players like, oh, he's going to be fantastic. Like Aaron Cool, part of the same generation of player. Completely different expectations about them and completely different career paths, perhaps as a result. But Liam Kelly comes across as a player I, I do agree in the sense that doesn't recognise the flow of the game doesn't have that ability to know when to try something different doesn't say you know what my my 
passing passing sideways hasn't worked for 60 minutes. Maybe I should get into the box and stuff. And it's it's indicative of a, a player who was brought up in a certain style. And it's the goes back to the old ownership saying that we play a certain way. And if you raise your Liam Kelly as a player who is a deep line playmaker and you don't occasionally you know throw him up front in the academy games and, and perhaps mix things up and and try something different with these players they do come out a little bit one dimensional and perhaps that's a complaint about our academy players of late is that they are a little bit one dimensional uh, I'll dispute that with Kelly I think the, the game that I always point to for Liam is you look at that Bristol City away game where we came from 2-0 down to win yeah. 3-2 yeah. Kelly was awesome that day and he was in and around the box he was sliding people in he was making runs he was awesome that day he's got it in his locker I go back to what I said about Stam and and I just wonder if he had this drilled into him so much that you've got retain possession you've got to keep the ball moving that again he's afraid to step out of that box and when he has tried to recently, it's not gone well. You know, he's misplacing passes and things like that. And that can make you go even further back into your shell. You now, it's a lot easier just to play that simple ball, drop back in line with the centre-backs and play it wide because you've, you've, you've done nothing wrong. You know, you can't be picked up doing something wrong if you're making those five, ten-yard passes all day long. It's why I think we've discussed this as a group uh, and the Tyler said in the past, you know, that central defensive midfielder can often look great because they just sit there playing pass, pass, pass. It, so I, I don't, I don't think that he's one dimensional. I just think he's either been the coaching has done him, you know, he's been sort of damaged by that coaching, or maybe there is something sort of psychologically or confidence wise that is making him think that this is the way I need to play. He's not a busted flush yet. He's not completely done. But again, as I was talking about with some of the upper management, he's on he's on increasingly borrowed time. The clock is ticking now on Liam Kelly. He's lost that tag of oh, in, completely inexperienced young player. He's now got to say, like like you said, he's got to prove he can adapt because otherwise he will end up like Hal Robson Canoe. But as much as we bash Hal Robson Canoe, this is a man that's had a career playing regularly in the Championship and the Premier League and international football. So Wales again, icon was how Ryan Giggs well, referred to him the other day, wasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. And he scored a couple of goals this season. Liam Kelly would give anything to be an English and or Irish icon. Yeah, don't knock. Don't knock. And, and it's funny, you know, I named the Harold Robson Canoe Award after him. <laughs> and if Liam Kelly does get that award named after him, and the thing I always said with Hal was that the whole reason he got that award named after him is because he could be really good. You know, we don't we didn't name that award because Hal Robson Canoe was total crap. We named it after him because we'd seen him play brilliantly and he just wasn't matching those standards. Liam's got to avoid the same trappings. Whether he can do that at Reading Football Club, I don't know because it seems that his chances are running out. He, I really, really hope, though, that he does sort of rediscover that form we saw in the Bristol City game and at times during that first season because he's got the ability in his locker. Time for him to show... Now, whether it's him growing up, whether it's a coach grabbing him by the scruff of the neck, not literally, and you can't do that on a training ground, um, <laughs> and just getting back to that form. There's a great little player in there. Hopefully we'll see it flourish. Hopefully, and, and seeing it flourish, well, we're almost there for uh, for seeing through the, uh, the state of Reading FC. There's only a couple more points that I want to bring up, and the, the next one is the fan base, and there is dropping attendances, as, as we all know at the moment, despite... The uh, the club doing ticket prices, they're okay at the moment. Club 1871 is, is good, but it's kind of limited if the team is crap. The the dropping tendencies, for me, when it comes to the fan base of Reading, I have long worried and feared whether we are doomed to be hit by being a town of immigrants. And I don't mean immigrants as in those bloody Eastern Europeans coming over here. They're not the problem at all. It's because we have a lot of immigrants natively and obviously otherwise as well. And I, I'm children of or a child of inward immigrants as it were English people who weren't born in Reading and therefore don't have the same local identity and I think in places such as Newcastle Leeds and perhaps Liverpool Glasgow etc etc you have a much bigger population of people who have lived in that city or town for generations and Reading doesn't have that so I kind of worry 
as a as a team and as a town, are we doomed to be a town of people who don't support the local team? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think it all just comes down to the product that's being served up. We've seen when Reading have been doing well, when they've got to the Premier League, that they've been turning, literally, I got turned away. I remember in the 2005-6 season getting turned away. You know, coming back from uni and not having a season ticket, I got turned away. And we've seen that 40,000 people will go to Wembley to watch Reading. You know, if the club is successful, if they're playing good football, people will come. Young people will, and kids will want to come and watch Reading because they're doing well. You know, call them what you like, call them fickle, call them plastics. But that makes up the vast majority of where these teams are getting their big attendances from. We're not unique. You, you look at historic, other historically big clubs, teams like Ipswich. Um, oh, I'm trying, I'm trying to think of teams off the top of my head. Slamptons. Portsmouth. Yeah, yeah. When times are down, the, fan, the fans drop because those casual fans who are coming for the entertainment and for the glory and the buzz aren't interested and it does take a special kind of of fan to see your team through thick and thin because you know you wouldn't go and sit through you know loads of awful films if if every film that was coming out in the cinema was awful you would soon stop going to the cinema you know if you kept going to the same restaurant and it was bad week after week you'd stop going to that restaurant and more people wouldn't be coming to that restaurant because you wouldn't be saying good things if Reading are winning week in, week out, suddenly that mate who you know only puts his Reading shirt on for Wembley is interested in coming because he thinks he's going to be entertained or she's going to be entertained and gets a you know, good night. Right now, I, could, I, couldn't sell, I couldn't sell a Reading game to my wife. I couldn't sell a Reading game to anybody because I know that if they see it, they're not going to want to come back. So it's a bad time. To to, no, it's a bad time to introduce people to the product. Um, what the club are really trying hard to do, and I'll give them a massive amount of credit for it, is they are doing their very best to make everything that is in their control enjoyable. They're doing the fan zone. They're doing Club 1871. They're doing, you know, the ticket prices are being kept low. They're doing everything they can. You know, the social media presence. They're, they're trying to create as good a buzz as they possibly can, but. Ultimately, I said, it's like a restaurant. You could have the nicest seats in the world, you know, the nicest waiter, you know, the, the friendliest thing, the best mu- music and everything in the world. If the food you're serving up is bad, that's what people are coming to see. So I, I don't think it, I, I do take your point. I don't think it helps the fact that there's not a massive history of Reading fans. You know, you don't have to go back very far, you know, 20, just over 20 years and Reading were getting, seven to nine thousand fans i think we're doing quite well to sit here being when we talk about fourteen thousand being low because back in even division one days at elm park seven thousand wasn't uncommon for a second tier game so uh, yeah the, the the transient fan and the lack of history doesn't help us but i don't think that you can sit there and go oh well yeah that's the reason why the fans aren't turning up every week well, I think Reading is always going to be a case of, like a lot of, perhaps it's a bit naive to say it's just bottom football, but Reading are going to be a lot of people's second teams nowadays. And when you have so such easy access to being an Arsenal fan and you can watch all the games, exactly. you had a, being a Reading fan isn't necessarily going to be your priority. It, and you say it might be the game you go actually physically go and watch because you're local to it, because you can't go and pay £700 or £1,000 for an Arsenal season ticket. But that's that's the nature of it, and that's a unique pop, pop sort of problem that the Reading going to have to deal with. It's a big. It's, it's, we could go. And, we could do an entire show on this, Mark. It's the instant gratification of supporting that big team. You know, you support an Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool. You're going to get success at some point. You're not going to have to wait too long for it. Um, you support Reading, and a lot of the times it's going to be a chore because we're not a team with a massive budget we're not a team with that have historically won trophies and in the society we live in at the moment it's harder than ever to tell people well you know you just got to stick through the bad times and you'll get to the good um so that's that's never going to help any club you look at i said you look at clubs up and down the country it you have to create something special you have to create a buzz look at huddersfield you know you look at huddersfield crowd 10 years ago it's dead suddenly they get this bounce and they get this buzz and this hype of 
trying to get to the Premier League for the first time in donkey's years, and everybody's a fan. Same with Palace after years in the doldrums. Stoke. It's the same, everyone. It's completely cyclical. I guarantee you, Reading start winning games, crowds will start picking up, and if we went on the sort of run that we had in 2005, 2006, this isn't even a conversation point. No, and let's move it on then, because the other thing I want to talk about about being a Reading fan these days is compared to the, the sheer wealth of information, except for that goes on for being an Arsenal Man United fan, is it harder to be a Reading fan now? Because in the last few years, we've seen local media, I would say, completely not to their own fault. It's the nature of, of the media that we're in at the moment. It's kind of being torn up. You know, Get Reading's obviously not a newspaper anymore. They're, they're shedding staff more than they're recruiting staff. The club is also... any. The club is very picky about what it does. I know that your your project with the club has, has obviously been on hiatus for this season because the the general answer from a lot of football clubs these days, and certainly from Reading, is no rather than yes. And the transfer gossip, and I always think that the transfer gossip is such an integral part to following a football team at you know, your lunchtime break in at work or something. The transfer gossip around Reading Football Club, these past probably for about five, six years now, maybe with the exception of the odd summer here and there. But it's been awful. You don't know who's signing for Reading. You don't get interesting players being linked with Reading or genuine, that sounds like it could happen. And all these things build up, I think, to make it actually quite difficult to be a, a switched-on Reading fan now. There's two ways of looking at it with transfer rumours. You can either say, you know, if the club is leaking names left, right and centre, look at the reaction when we were about to sign Sam Bulldog. You go through Twitter and half of it is saying, oh, God, he's a donkey that couldn't get into Brighton's team. So what's the point? It immediately creates a negative buzz before the players even signed. Likewise, if they were suddenly leaking names we were never going to sign, say they're linking, if they are putting the name Shane Long out there, and then we don't deliver, fans are eventually going to be like, oh, why can't Reading get these deals done? Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I, with the budget that we do seem to have, yeah, we're spending more money than ever before, but we're still not going out and spending the huge sums that other clubs can. What's what, you know? What's the point? What is the point in building up the hopes that you're never going? You know, there's no payoff. There's no happy payoff. I said you're just going to get annoyed if every rumor you hear. You know, I noticed on the tire list end you're keeping a rumor tracker, and I'm going to be fascinated to see how many of those rumors that we were linked with actually came out. I would imagine it's what probably going to be five ten percent. Oh yeah, definitely. Of that, so it, is it hard to be a running fan? Well, you've got fantastic websites. I'm biased, but like the tire list end. You've got people on Twitter pumping out constant news, be it the club, the club themselves about their game. They're putting out a lot more content this year. You know, you've got your familiar faces, whether it's, you know, I dare I mention the name on this podcast. You've got your Elm Park Royals, your talk, you know, your talk Reddings, all these people doing their best to keep the buzz around the club going and discussion. So I think, you know, you can follow as far as what the club are putting out there. Ultimately, there's business considerations and I don't think Reading are that much different from any other club. Yeah, you get the odd quirky one, but if, you know, your quirky ones like Bristol City end up then getting themselves into trouble, don't they? Yeah, they put out yeah. these gold gifts and then suddenly it's hunting season for every other club and fan base. So um, I, I would say it's just harder to be a Reading fan because again, right now you're starved of, you know, the last four or five seasons has been quite starved of success. I think it's also when it comes to um, the sort of the fact that we are doing the ticket prices, Club 1871 is good, but you've got to remember that Reading is being run by people who are, by definition, and I'm not trying to insult anyone who works for the club, but by definition, people who are of the championship quality. We we can't get the Premier League. You would imagine, by definition, that Man United and Man City pay their media staff the best wages that they have. They bring them in from best clubs and say they're doing well, we'll sign them up because we want the best media. Reading our championship in that respect. So but I do get annoyed when Sweet Caroline isn't played perfectly timed just as kickoff is happening at the Medeski Stadium. But, you know, you're, you're, de- you're dealing with people who, you know, they're professionals and they're very good at their job. But sometimes, you know, people are limited by their sort of environment and by what's going on around them and everything like that. And sometimes, sometimes the answer is a little bit closer to home than we realise. And yeah, and again, and again, if if we w- if we did go and invest in the best PA man in the world and the best, you know, this that and the other, then fans would be then turn around and say, oh well, is it not better to spend that money buying another striker? 
Mm. That's that's how most football clubs operate. Most football clubs will scrimp as much as they possibly can behind the scenes to get the best product on the pitch because that's what fans want to see. So, you know, fans very rarely say, you know, when the PA now does a good job signing him up sort of thing, are they? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I do have a bit of sympathy. For, but like you say, the, the club isn't exactly going to be beyond flush with cash right now. Um, so, but I, I can say from my workings behind the scenes with the club, all, all I can say is that everybody that I've come into contact with in, in my role hosting the Royal Exchange has been working damn hard. And I know they've been putting in the effort. I know that they are trying. Uh, and I know there is a lot of talent there. So I, I think we are, I think in a lot of places we are in very good hands. Yeah, maybe they can just practice the sweet Caroline timing thing a couple more times than it seems like they do. Because Next time it, I speak to them, I, I will find this out. And it I does will, certainly seem to it. me like a lot of the time the referee and the opposition players are kind of stood there waiting. Like, guys, <laughs> we're, we're here to play football and we're on like the first verse. <laughs> yeah. It is a bit I think we're still playing as uh, as Sheffield Wednesday scored. On <laughs> yeah, on exactly. So um, so maybe we don't do that so often. But the final... Final point of this uh, this comprehensive look across the club is that mainly because it's the international break is why we're doing it. We're not doing it particularly because uh, we're it's a double level, issue. It's it special. Is, it is it is kind of coincidental and, and useful to an extent that we are bottom of the championship while we do this. But the sense that I know some fans are of the opinion that a relegation would not be the worst thing in the world. A Mac has tweeted us saying, "What would relegation really mean for Reading? And how many of this squad could cut it in League One?" The point I want to hone in on there is what would it really mean and would it be, like it has been for some clubs, the reinvigoration of that club that has been required, you know, I think at Leicester, Wolves, a certain couple of examples, Southampton certainly reinvigorated them as they honed in on their academy and whatnot. Is it too big a risk to rely on it being a reinvigoration? Uh, you know, do you think that it could actually work? <sighs> Um, should you need to hit rock bottom to bounce back? Um, you shouldn't have to, you know, is it the only way Reading are going to build momentum back up? Hopefully not. Would it be the worst thing in the world? Look, from a fan's point of view, probably not. Um, you're going to see a slightly lower quality of football across the board, but you're going to have interesting new away days, have interesting new visitors. This is going to be something fresh. We're probably going to be in a promotion race. You certainly hope so. So that would be quite exciting. But then, if everything went well, a year from then, you'd be back in the same situation, except you would have a smaller budget, you would have less championship quality players, because you would have had to colour low from the squad, and you would probably be fighting against... Look at Wigan. You know, Wigan came up, straight back down. Most of the teams that go up do go straight back down, um, or are in the mix. You know, your Barnsley's of this world. Would Reading be any different? There's no guarantee that we that we would and you know for all of your Wolves and your Leicesters you've got your Bradfords you've got your Swindons you've got you know your, your Lutons your Oxfords these teams that have been in around you know Stockport you talk about you know the Elm Park here I remember Stockport being a championship side and now what are they are they still in the conference north still now or do they sneak back into the National Bloomsby League Bloomsby as well all the shot yeah. Yeovil dropping all... all the way out of the league yeah, there, there is nothing to say that Reading, it would be a guaranteed great time. So I'd rather avoid relegation entirely. But in terms of would it mean, would it be the worst thing in the world? It wouldn't be the worst thing, especially from a fan point of view, just a purely turning up week in, week out. But for the club's point of view, you know, you just mentioned about, you know, being able to employ X, Y and Z behind the scenes. You, you'd be looking at a massive cull because, again, financial fair play restrictions are even worse. You'd have to pay. You've got 30 professionals on your books now. How many people are going to be begging to take those players off your hands if they get relegated? You know, so there's no guarantee that you'd be able to sweep the decks. And there's no guarantee that those players would want to play really well in League One. So this club really needs to avoid relegation. I, I really, as much as it is romantic and I some, sometimes mind just off thinking oh would it be bad cold light of day yeah it would be it, it would be bad and we need to avoid it yeah my opinion on the relegation thing is that when you're 
a fan who I think my my first serious season of watching Reading was the first season after we got promoted out of League One. So having never seen it, there is that temptation to sort of say, oh, what what would happen? But the thing is, I mean, I would even even if it meant all that you said and we did get a promotion season out of League One, I would still kind of think that from a selfish fan point of view, it'd probably just about be worth it to have that season, to you know get the relegation out of the way, have that season of promotion, maybe a Wembley win or something like that. To have oh, that, if you offer me a playoff final, maybe I'd take it, yeah. Yeah, it would just be worth it. But the thing is, is that you can talk to fans of Coventry, you can talk to fans of Portsmouth, you can talk to a lot of fans who probably thought with real justification that they're too big for where they were going. Bradford is another one. Think, you know what, we're, we're too good for this and we'll, we'll rightfully regain our Look place. how long it took Sheffield United to get back up. Exactly. And there is, it is football. There is no guarantee one way or another that you'll, that you'll have great success or obviously that you'll, you'll keep falling. And I often think about you know, the question, where is rock bottom for Reading? And the question for that is, the answer for that rather, is uh, insolvency and being AFC Reading in the conference South yeah. Evo stick Premier Division third <laughs> tier. Like, that's where it is. You don't get to just, you don't get to League Two and someone says, oh no, that's it, you'll stop now, that's fine. We'll keep you there for five years and you can rebuild. It's it's very difficult to reverse these sort of things. And and you know, with hindsight, a, a drop out and an immediate rise would be okay, I think, just about. But it's not a. That's not certainly what you can get. And we'll um, we'll move on then. We'll, we'll have a, a quick break and move on to the final part of the show and talk about where we go from here in the immediate future and talk about what will happen after the international break and exactly whether that relegation thing is going to become any more real in the next few games. Get social with the boys. Find them on Twitter at the Tarlhurst End and Facebook.com forward slash the Tarlhurst End. Right, back into the present day then, and the question is where is the next result coming from? Reading after the international break go to Preston. They then have Norwich and Hull at home. And starting going on the road to Preston, it's not a place that I can ever really imagine Reading winning. I think we won there in 2005 and we picked up the odd point there every now and then. The only thing that I can think of us getting a result at Preston is the sense that kind of like last year, when there's too much pressure at home, we might have an actual OK chance of succeeding on the road. Yeah, I mean, we we went up to Blackburn not expecting very much and should have won that game. Um, Same with Villa, we went up there and got a point, a bit possibly less deserved but we, we still went and did it I remember us winning actually at Preston under Brendan Rodgers um, in 2000 I think Kebe when it's called a, a great goal um, in similar unexpected circumstances so I think the one thing you can say is that the, the squad has has hit rock bottom in terms of where it has been recently um, the only way is really up I, I don't really see much way down and you say that, then we get beat 6 now. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, famous last words from me. But you actually look at the performances all season and none of them have been horrific. None of them have been where you think we've been totally outclassed by this side. Oh, we had no chance of winning at all. Every game, I think I'm right in saying we've lost every game by, we've either drawn it or lost it by one goal, which is actually a good sign. We're not getting blown away. We're not getting taken apart and we're keeping ourselves in game. So, do I expect us to go and win this game? No, but I, I certainly would back us to get at least a point and a win would be a, a far from surprising outcome. If someone had £100 and they say, should I bet on this game? I'd say, don't bet on this game because it's not... Hashtag gamble aware. Hashtag gamble aware, but it's such a... It's a classic championship game in a sense, kind of like when we went to Villa, that just because a team who is decent at home plays a team who is bad away from home, it doesn't mean they beat them. And I know that for a fact because I've seen Reading, who are good at home, lose plenty of games to teams who mm. are bad away from home over the years. And you put, I think, if let's say that's a draw or loss, which is certainly how the uh, how the um, the bookies would sort of see it. Norwich and Hull at home afterwards, and say we get zero wins from those three games. Is that Paul Clement gone, or is that Paul Clement seriously asked, or seriously the question being asked of him going? Because I think if we, you know, draw one and, and lose two of those three games, there is going to be a serious onus on Paul Clement's future 
and that we don't have at the moment? Uh, I, th- I, I don't. I have no idea what the owners would do. They gave Yapstam a long time uh, of bad form before they made a decision, but it would be very hard for him to carry on if we go. You know what? With that, you know, if we if we fail to beat Norwich and Hull, that would take us to what five home games to start the season without a win. Without well, exactly the hardest home games as well. Yeah, um, especially Hull, who are going to be down there with us as well. You could almost forgive maybe Norwich grabbing something, but not Hull. It would be very difficult, I think, if Reading failed to get a win from those three games for Clement to carry on. Um, but sh- should he go? That's another question, but. Yeah, I mean, how many managers survive after going nine games without a win to start a season? Very, very few. Very few indeed. Even the ones that have done really well the the previous season would be struggling, yet alone a man who's only just kept us up. So I think he knows realistically he's going to have to get a win in one of those three games, and hopefully he will. Hopefully he'll get a couple. And after that, it's Brentford away, and then uh, into the start of October is QPR at home, and... As five fixtures go in the championship, those are not the worst five fixtures. Two away games and the three teams who are all mid to low table at home. That QPR home game is, I mean, it already feels like it's looming for me (laughs) as the traditional please sack me game. Whoever loses that is going to be going out to the to the board the next day saying, please just sack me because <laughs> QPR and Reading are the two, in my opinion, the two worst teams in the championship after the first few games this season. And Steve McLaren, I can't imagine he's going to make it to the end of the season. And Paul Clement, I mean, do we think that... We, we know Yapstam got a lot of time, but do we think that Paul Clement will be sitting there at the end of those five games saying... You know, we've pulled a couple wins together and we've got a draw out of maybe one of the others and we're, we're looking better. Do you think that that is obviously the, uh, a scenario we want to happen? Do you, do you think it's it's likely? Um, yes. I still, for as bad as the results have been, I still don't think Reading are too far away. I think there's been... Um, the guys that do things based on you know, expected goals, a lot of the chart times Reading are coming out on the unlucky scale of those things. Several games this season, and Bolton and Sheffield Wednesday, I think both of those games on the balance that we deserve to win, um, just based purely on chances. We, we can't, you know, we talked about being lucky, and and the season we finished third under Yap. I don't think Reading can continue to be this unlucky. I really don't think we're too far away from being an average championship side. I think we're a long way away from being a top six championship side, but I don't think that that's going to be the aim this year. I don't think that it's going to take too much to turn us into a mid table championship side, especially when players have had more chance to bed in, when we get a little bit of confidence and just what one win will do to the squad will hopefully be massive. A bit of stability, Suddenly, you na- and then able to name the same eleven players week in, week out. You stay clear of injuries, and Reading go and get a point at Preston, and then pick up four points from Norwich and Hull. Suddenly, you've got seven points on the board, and your season really fills up and running. So, I'm cautiously optimistic that it's going to get turned round in the in the short to medium term. It's just a case of can that momentum continue going to a point where we're back up to the top six. And that's going to take more than um, more than a few months to figure out. Yeah, I, I, I must admit, when it comes to the, the immediate future, I'm I'm not convinced that, that the luck will turn anytime soon. I think we have been genuinely unlucky. I think we were unlucky last year as well. There were a lot of stand games that we were quite unlucky in. And it gets to that point, you wonder, is the catalyst going to be a home draw? Are we going to nick a late draw against Norwich or Hull? Is, is that going to be where it's come from? Getting from from losing to winning, I think you kind of need a little bit of period in the in the middle to start drawing games, and maybe that's what will do it for us. And you know, we we can still be in the relegation zone in December, and probably only a few points off safety, and still genuinely believe that we can get somewhere. But um, but nonetheless, I will for the moment I'll uh, I'll admit uh inferiority to your to your prediction abilities because I won't go into the nitty gritty <laughs> of the prediction league how, for how it is at the moment but all I know is that uh, Dan Wimbush is comfortably 
in the lead, having there we go. three absolute nailed-on results so far. So, uh, so congratulations on that. And if you do win, then I'm, I'm very sorry, but you'll probably never be back on the show again. Well, well there you, you go. I, I can no the complaints. prediction league as well, but nonetheless, that's uh, that's not too bad to start off. Yeah, well, I, I I will I will sit atop the mountain for the time being. I think I've won the prediction league once before, and hopefully this will be uh, title number two. But look, I take no joy in uh, having been right so far this season. Oh, but although I think that the ones I'm getting right, I've, I've been cautious up to, are the ones I've been cautious optimistic for. Um, so there you go. But yeah, hopefully long may my prediction reign continue and I will be predicting some more positive results over the next three games and I very, very much hope I'm right there. Well, you have pl- plenty of time to think about the Preston game. So all that uh, remains is for me to thank you for uh, for popping back on, Dan. It's always nice to catch up and, and talk Reading FC and hopefully uh, you've been keeping quiet in your, your sort of spare room talking to not wake your young daughter up as well. No, uh, Wimp Junior Junior. Is, is safely asleep downstairs. Uh, she's been very good. It's been great uh, being a dad and, and getting to learn that. And it's been great uh, do, doing stuff for the football club. I'll, I'll just say, uh, I posted a message on Twitter as well, um, that the Royal Exchange, that the projects I've been involved with on the TV side of things, we're on hiatus, as mentioned. Uh, I don't know when we'll be back. There, There is support for it to come back and you know we're, we're sort of cautiously optimistic that we will be back at some stage but i don't know when there is a chance it might not come back and if not um i had an absolute blast doing it speaking to some really great players and i like seeing that you know those players were very honest we didn't go into the interview saying oh you know i'm gonna feed you nice questions on this that or the other they were very open they were honest and that's why i'm really rooting for the club to do well and i'm not you know I imagine some fans might turn around and say, oh, Wim, you, you know, you, you, you're trying to be too positive here. You're not saying your mind. Uh, I am saying my mind. I'm I'm as frustrated as anybody at the moment. And all these views are very much my own, uh, <laughs> believe me. But I just really want it to turn around because I see that I have seen firsthand the people that are working so hard off the pitch and on it. And I really know that, that they are desperately keen for the club to do well and, and long may that continue. So, yeah, thanks for all the support. Um, from those of you who watch the Royal Exchange and hopefully we'll be back and just say you guys have been killing it as well uh, here on the Southwest End. It was uh, a a real tough one to give it up this time last year, but certainly I I know I made the right decision with with the little one that's sleeping downstairs. But yeah, great to come back on the show and hopefully better pop back on uh, some point down the road. Yeah, absolutely. There, there will always be a spot for you here. And I wanted to end uh, this show with an email that we received from Richard Holloway a few days ago and it talks about his father Peter Holloway who passed away suddenly on the 30th of August Pete Richard saying that he believes Peter was Reading's longest supporting fan born on 8th of November 1927 a regular season ticket holder who has been going to Reading since he was very very young he recollected that his first game was at home to Luton perhaps in November 1934 rest in peace Reading Football Club will miss you and I wanted to add that in at the end of the show because there was a lot of frustration after the Sheffield Wednesday game. There's been a lot of frustration all throughout the season and certainly from us as well and from anyone involved in the club. And it's nice now, I think, that we have the international break. I think it's come at a good time for Reading. We can take a couple of weeks off, just chill out in a large sense, <laughs> recollect and, and reminisce about the good days and just think about what is really important. Get football out of our system. You don't need to watch the UEFA Nations League. It's not that important. When the <laughs> important football comes back around, we'll have had two weeks off. We'll all be fresh. And then we have some very, very important games to get in our teeth stuck into. And hopefully, by the time we come back, there will be some Reading victories on the board in 2018-19. And come on, you ours.
Just a 